1976, you know, I was a massive rock fan. I used to buy all the music papers and that. But I had a really boring job. I worked uh, in a bank as a bank clerk. And, you know, there was no way you could get involved with music. You know, I used to go to loads of gigs, see the likes of The Who, Led Zeppelin and all that. But you just, I was just like a punter. I started reading about the punk rock scene that was happening in New York at the time. Reading about bands like Television, The Ramones, you know, Blondie. It just seemed so exciting. And then finally the Ramones came to London. They were supporting Flaming Groovies. They played at the Roundhouse on the 4th of July, 76. And that was just such a big moment for me. It was like, I must get involved in this scene. And uh, because I, I wasn't a musician or anything like that, I just I was trying to find another way of getting involved, you know? And the idea I came up with is do a fanzine. I sort of knew about fanzines. I sort of bought a couple before because there used to be fanzines about things like reggae, you know, marginalised sort of music. Plus coming out of New York at the time, there was a, a magazine called Punk Magazine, which I'd seen a couple of issues of. So I thought, I just thought of the idea of doing a, a, a fanzine, a punk magazine for the UK. And that's, that's why I come up with the idea of Sniffing Glue magazine. I just used what I had available. I mean, luckily, I had this old children's typewriter. So I typed, all the, typed it all out on that. But for the headings and that, because I still, I wanted it to look like a magazine. I didn't want it to look rubbish, you know. So for the headings, I used to use a felt tip pen, you know, a big marker to do the headings. And, and just done it in, you know, the best I could, you know, sort of like, you know, DIY in my sort of bedroom sort of thing. There was a shop in Canada and they were called Rock On, Rock On Records. And they're the first people I said, look, I've done this fanzine, would you like to sell some in the shop? And they saw it and straight away they said, yeah, where have, you know, we want 50 copies. I said, well, that's all I've got. So they bought all that I had and then they actually advanced me money to get some more made. And then through Rock On, I ended up, there was this distributors called bizarre so they started taking stuff and they used to sort of sell records all the record shops in the country a lot of independent record shops and that and so that's how it grew one thing i liked about early punk it was sort of disposable you know if you were there and you managed to get a copy you get if you weren't tough sort of thing you have to wait the book comes out in 40 years time you could read stuff in the glue for example we did the first ever interview with the clash the first place to find that out was in sniffing glue you know what I mean? So you were told stuff in there you wouldn't find elsewhere. That's never going to happen again. You know, if you want to interview the bands, you didn't have to, you didn't go through their PR. You just chatted to them at bar. You, you went up to Joe's drum and said, here, can we do an interview? He said, why? You know, what's it for? Oh, I've got this great fan. Oh, I've seen that. You know, and then two days later, it was, you were in their rehearsal room interviewing them. It was easy to get involved and be in the first punk fanzine. Of course, people wanted to be in it. You know, they wanted to be on the front cover, you know. It wasn't like we all knew each other and we'd got this master plan, but it seemed like everyone was going about producing posters, fanzines, records in a DIY manner because they, we were outside of the, the music business. The DIY scene of the punks, it happened sort of organically in a way, where suddenly you were seeing like, actually, the Sex Pistol poster sort of looks a bit like Sniffing Glue. So we're all sort of doing the same sort of thing without, and of course, and I think that's where that, where that look came from. And of course it was perfect to go with the music because the idea about punk was a, it was a rejection of the sophistication of what rock music had become with progressive, progressive rock, Pink Floyd and all that, you know, the idea that you had to learn how to play guitar for years before you could play music. But punk took everything to ground zero. So whether it was the music, the fanzines, the posters, the record sleeve, it all had that DIY look because we were doing the sort of best we could, but we weren't professionals. I always think that I was lucky to sort of just come in at the right time to catch that, to catch the wave of of when punk was just exploding and it was just so nice to be at the centre of that, you know, and to be, you know, to be recognised as, as, you know, the most important punk magazine at the time. That's why Sniffing Glue is so es essential. You know, if you want to read about the punk scene, you can read a book that was written 30 years later, but, you know, you, you, you get the complete collection of Sniffing Glues and that's the story there. It's almost like the diary of the punk scene. I mean, the idea that someone said it would be seen as some sort of iconic look or something or, you know, designs for the process. You don't realise that years later this is going to be held as some sort of like substantial sort of movement and all that. <laughs> we were in the Sniffing Glue offices and all the bands, when they used to come over from the States, one of the visits to do is to visit Sniffing Glue. And one day Blondie came up and I was talking to Demi, she went, oh, should I love your magazine? She went, and you do it on pink paper, that's really cool. And I was like, 
Pink Pie, we didn't do that. Oh yeah, I bought a pink, uh, copy on Pink Pie, but Bleak of Bob's, and yeah. So when I looked into it, I found out that Bleak of Bob was buying like copies of Sniffing Glue here, going back to the States with them, and making his own versions of them, you know what I mean? So it's why I tell people, if you've got a copy of Sniffing Glue now, there's no guarantee it's the real thing. As we got bigger, we then had to get more income in order to produce, and it, it's like a vicious circle of like growth, you know? And part of that, which is against my sort of better judgment, was to start taking in ads. You know, the more ads we had, the less I got interested. I was never happy about that, which is why Sniffing Glue ended when it did, because by that time, punk music had sort of been, you know, was in the charts. I honestly thought Sniffing Glue wasn't needed anymore. It wasn't like the voice of the street anymore. So that's why we sort of ended it on the 12th issue. You know, sort of neatly sort of finished it then. I've always come from what I feel was the right place. I was never thinking about, yeah, we can make big bucks with this, you know what I mean, where others might have been. I, was, I think something was precious. You know, I think it, 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 it sort of represents something that was precious. What happened to a lot of these magazines is they just go on for too long. I never wanted to happen to Sniffing Glue. I wanted to end on a high and sort of keep that name as, as a, just a sort of beacon of DIY sort of, <laughs> you know, brilliance, you know. Must have enough to use by now.